Hey, SE Online, homecoming is coming up October 6th, 7th, and 8th. You'll be joining your online family from across the country and around the world right here in Louisville, Kentucky. We're really excited because on Saturday night, we're going to have a riverboat cruise where you're going to have the opportunity to worship and hang out on the Ohio River with your SE Online family. You can text the word homecoming to 733-733 to sign up today. We would love to see you there. All right, everyone, welcome to Southeast Online. Thrilled that you are here. That's Sarah, <laughs> I'm Steven, you're in the right place. Uh, two of my American friends joining us this weekend. Happy Memorial Day. I know, uh, Sarah, it's a great time as Americans where we are just grateful mm -hmm. for the people that came before us yeah. to make uh, this nation great. Yeah, happy Sunday, everybody. We're really glad you're here. Wherever you are in the world, you know, if you are with friends and family celebrating Memorial Day, we're really glad that you've joined us. One thing that we do wanna make sure you know, Homecoming is coming up yes, October 6th, is. 7th, and 8th. Registration is now open, so you can text that word homecoming to 733-733. You just saw a quick sneak peek yep. at what we're going to be doing with our online family this October, taking a riverboat boat cruise on the Ohio, getting to worship with our online family together. It's going to be great. Please text that word homecoming. We would love to see you. It is the moment, if you've been looking to come to Louisville, Kentucky, that we want to see <laughs> you here. It's a great opportunity just to get to hang out with your SE Online family. So hopefully uh, we'll see you at homecoming. Uh, this weekend, we are going to be concluding our series called One Thing Leads to Another. It's all about the life of Joseph. And to conclude it, we've got Carl Cool. He's our executive pastor. So before I go any further, talking about this weekend, I thought Carl will give us a quick preview. So here he is. Hey, online family, this is Carl. I've got my coffee, hope you got yours. I'm backstage with the team who's all getting ready um, for a great service today. Today we're wrapping up our series, One Thing Leads to Another, and we're talking about God's destiny. And sometimes when I hear that word, I think of all the times destiny is talked about in the movies, like in Back to the Future or something like that. But we believe God has a destiny for you. We're gonna learn about it today. I'm excited, can't wait to teach today. Sarah, I think that's the central question we all have. <laughs> Destiny, purpose, what's God want me to do with my life? I can't wait to hear what Carl has to say because this is so timely and such a chaotic question for so yes. many people. So I can't wait to see how Carl brings clarity to what destiny means. Yeah, me too. I've loved this sermon series. Yep. I don't know about you, Stephen. But yeah, destiny can also be related to purpose. I know we kind of get hung up on mm -hmm, that destiny mm -hmm. word sometimes, but it's all about, hey, what's God's will for my life? What is my purpose? Even yep. when there's pain and confusion and disappointment. Yep. So looking forward to hear from Carl on that today. Let's head into worship, guys. Make sure you stay tuned after service. We're going to have more information about we'll homecoming here. and just some different opportunities to be more involved with the life of Southeast with this summer. So let's worship, guys. We will see you after service. All right, let's sing this out. Oh, my soul, it overflows at the power of your love. Bones awake and graves are brave.
And God, we, we gather to remind you that we are forever yours. And God, we gather to remind ourselves that we are forever yours. And we believe, we choose to believe that no power of hell can stand against your word. And it is the word of hope, it is the word of grace, it is the word of truth. So God, I pray that right now you will teach us from that word because we need more hope and we need more grace and we need more truth. We love you, Lord. Thank you for loving us first. Amen. You can be seated. Well, AI is quickly changing our world. I don't know if you saw the news that quickly went viral on Monday of this week. There was a picture of an explosion at the Pentagon. It was quickly shared on social media. Immediately, the stock market started to dip because people didn't know, are we at war? Is there a terrorist attack? Is this an accident? But almost immediately, the Pentagon put out a statement and said, there ain't no explosion here. Uh, everything's fine. The Pentagon police say everything is just checking out A-OK. -okay. It was an AI-generated photo. It was a fake. And this is the most recent in a string of these lately. I don't know if you've, how many of these you've seen. There was the picture of President Trump being arrested. Again, a fake generated by AI. And then my favorite was the Pope in a puffer jacket. <laughs> That's not real, but it should be. In fact, put that picture back up there real quick. Somebody said, um, we need to get Kyle one of these. I thought that was a good idea. But there are others, right? There's, there's um, others that you've seen like this and we are being trained very quickly as a society to be skeptical of what we see in the news or in pictures that are shared online where we think our instinctual response needs to be, really? Was there really an explosion at the Pentagon? Is the Pope really into style? Was Selena Gomez really at the Met Gala? Because I thought she wasn't there. And so Google's trying to figure out how they can have technology that will label AI-generated photos as fake so you never believe them from the start. Other people are saying, here's what to look for, how to research things so you don't fall for it, hook, line, and sinker. But we're being trained to question what's in front of us. We're wrapping up a series today on God's will. We've talked about God's will in a few different ways. We've said uh, that God's will is like a flashlight that shows you your next step or two rather than a floodlight that illuminates the entire rest of your life. God's revealed will is more important than his specific will, meaning often when we want God's will for our lives, we want some little tiny nuance where God is more concerned with our we obeying scripture about generosity and forgiveness and purity. God's will involves dedication. It's the, it's the daily work of following God. We've talked about how the blessing of God can sometimes distract us from the will of God if we're not careful. So we've, we've learned a lot from the story of Joseph in this series, but I think a lot of us walk in these rooms today as we talk about God's will and we kind of approach it like we approach AI-generated photos because when we hear about God's will, the question we ask is, really? Does God really have a will for me? Does God really have a destiny for me? Is what happened to Joseph, is that really something that can happen to me where God is in charge of it all? Because we hear about this big, compelling thing called God's will, but then we look at our reality and we think, really? Because on one hand, life is mundane. God has a will for you. But life is job and diapers and errands. God has a will for you, but life is doctor's appointments and medications. God has a will for you, but life is school and homework and school and homework and school and homework. God has a will for you, but your life seems to consist of checking one thing off the to-do list only to add two more. And then on the other hand, we hear God has a will for us, but we look inward. And God has a will for me, but there was that college stage. God has a will for me, but I'm going through my third divorce. Or God has a will for me, but I know my dark thoughts. I know how evil I am. Really? 
And you read in your Bible and you hear in church that God has a will for your life, but I think if a lot of us were honest, we'd say, really? And we come to the end of Joseph's story today, and our key verse is going to explicitly say that God has a will for your life, that God has a destiny for your life. It's even gonna remind you, if you're familiar with the Bible, of that famous verse in Romans 8, that God works all things together for good for those who love the Lord. But when you hear that verse, and you look at your life, we often think, really? Sometimes I wish God's will was like one of those old magic eight balls. Remember that, you just shake it up, and all signs point to yes. Okay, now I know what I should do, right? Or I've met Christians who um, treat God's will like a fortune cookie. Like, let me just see what is happening and I will go wherever it says. In fact, I literally had friends who were Christians several years ago um, praying about, uh, they had prayed about and decided to put an offer in to buy their first home. Big decision, big, big money involved, but they felt like this is what we're supposed to do. But right before they met up with the realtor to sign the papers, they went to Chinese and over, because of what a fortune cookie said, they decided not to put an offer in on the house. But what does the fact that God has a destiny for us really mean? In our day-to-day lives, how does it impact us? Like, does, does it really impact our dating life? Does it change our faith? Does it, does it help anything this week? I think it does. I believe that if your marriage is struggling, God's gonna reveal a little bit more of his purpose for you today. I believe if you're figuring out direction for your life, God is gonna nudge you a little bit in the right direction today. I I believe if you're investigating Jesus, God's gonna reveal himself to you today. I believe that. So let's dig in. Remember, Joseph had been sold into slavery by his brothers, then becomes the most powerful man in Egypt. His brothers then come to him for food, and there's a reuniting of the family that occurs. It's all good. We pick up in Genesis chapter 50. But now that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers became fearful. Now Joseph will show his anger and pay us back for all the wrong we did to him, they said. So they sent this message to Joseph. They're too afraid to say it in person. They they sent him a note. Before your father died, he instructed us to say to you, please forgive your brothers for the great wrong they did to you, for their sin in treating you so cruelly. So we... The servants of the God of your father, Joseph, beg you to forgive our sin. When Joseph received the message, he broke down and wept. And based on the context, I think he's weeping because he realizes my brothers don't get this, that the forgiveness I offered was real. Then his brothers, I think this part's funny. Then his brothers came and threw themselves down before Joseph. Here's why I think this is funny. Like how afraid, think of this, how afraid would you have to be of your sibling to bow down to him? pretty afraid. Look, we're your slaves, they said. But Joseph replied, don't be afraid of me. Am I God? Don't fear me, fear God, that I can punish you. You intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. In that verse, verse 20 is our key verse. God intended it all for good. We're talking about destiny today. And that's the idea that God brings everything together for his, for his purpose. Philip Yancey called believing in advance, Philip Yancey called faith, believing in advance would only make sense in reverse. And if we get this in us, it takes care of so much. Like if this verse gets in us, we can get through trials, right? Because I can get through suffering if I know my suffering has a purpose. If we get this verse in us, we'll have joy. Joy is that deep well of God-given happiness that knows your purpose is greater than your circumstance. This verse helps you battle loneliness. It focuses you on heaven. It creates gratitude in you. I think you could argue this verse is key to the Christian life. Remember the parable of the sower? Jesus says, the kingdom of God is like this. Uh, A bunch of people are gonna start following me and stuff will sprout up. But but a bunch of them sadly will die off because they're not rooted. If you don't have the perspective of Genesis 50 verse 20, you won't last as a Christian. I'm not a prophet. I just don't think it's possible. 
That's why Stephen Covey says one of the habits of highly successful people is to begin with the end in mind. If the Christian knows that one day we will see how God intended it all for good, we won't just endure, we will thrive in the Christian life. So in order for us to get Genesis 50 verse 20, in order for us to believe it, for our lives to reflect it, we're gonna kind of use this verse as a a springboard to look at Joseph's life as a whole to get three lessons so that we can believe that we are walking in God's destiny. So first lesson, understand Christian hope is not a wish. Christian hope is not a wish. Most of the time when we in our culture use the word hope, what we really mean is wish, right? So we'll say, I hope I lose 10 pounds before bathing suit season. I hope I have a long lost relative I've never met who leaves me millions of dollars. I hope my team wins the World Series. What are we saying? We're saying, I wish those things would happen. I wish I'd magically lose 10 pounds without trying. I wish I'd inherit millions of dollars I didn't work for. I wish my team that hasn't made any changes to its lineup will suddenly play completely different ball and rise to the top of the division. Culturally, when we say hope, what we mean is wish. But the New Testament is different. The New Testament word, the Greek word for hope is Elpis, E-L-P-I-S. I want you to say Elpis out loud. One, two, three, go. Elpis, yeah. And that word doesn't mean wish. It actually means confident expectation. Let me show you a few examples of this. We could do a lot. We're just gonna do a few of them. Uh, 2 Corinthians 3 says, since we have such an Elpis, we're very bold. Think about this. A wish doesn't make you bold. A wish can't make you bold. Rather, A confident expectation makes you very bold. Look at the next one in the book of Hebrews chapter nine. This elpis is a strong anchor. A wish is not an anchor. A confident expectation is a trustworthy anchor for our souls. Look at the next one, Romans 15. Such things were written in the scriptures long ago to teach us. The scriptures give us elpis and encouragement as we wait patiently for God's promise to be fulfilled. The scriptures don't give us a wish. We're not wishing that things will be fulfilled. We have a confident expectation in God's promises. Christian hope is not a wish. And we have to understand this because Genesis 50 verse 20, God intended it all for good. That's our destiny. It's not a wish. It's something different. When scripture uses the word hope, it talks about a confident expectation. And to go even deeper, it's all based on the empty tomb. See, Joseph could look back on his life to see that God intended it for good. The Christian looks back on the empty tomb to see that God intended it all for good. This is why Paul's rant in 1 Corinthians 15 is so important. Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture said. This is the reason for our faith. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scripture said. Why do we believe that? because he was seen by Peter and the 12. He was seen by more than 500 at one time. He was seen by James and later all the apostles. And last of all, even I saw him. And this is the same reason Paul later says, if Christ hasn't been raised, our faith is futile. Okay, that is logical, but how do we know Christ has been raised? Raised, 1 Corinthians 15, because he was seen, our hope is real. See, the Christian doesn't wish The Christian has hope, which is something different. Which means when the pangs of grief sneak up on you about your loved one who has since died and gone to heaven because they have faith in Jesus, and that voice of skepticism starts going and saying, are you sure about this whole eternity thing? Are you sure you're ever gonna see them again? You don't wish you'll see them again because the empty tomb, you have a confident expectation that due to your faith in Jesus, you will see them again. When the chronic pain is relentless, you don't wish it'll go away and say, I wish the doctors just knew more about medicine so they could help my situation. No, you have a confident expectation that one day you'll be raised with a glorified body. When you fall to the same sin again and again are face to face with how deplorable you are, you don't wish you'd get better. You have confident expectation that even after your sin is fresh, that God is still working in you even though you don't see the fruit yet. I was with a friend this week 
who I've been journeying with for several years now. Um, and he had told me when we first started talking about this that he was exposed to pornography against his will at a very young age, multiple times. And it developed in, in him this irresistible habit. I don't know what else to call it, but an addiction. And he has sought all kinds of help, uh, secular and Christian, to try and conquer this temptation. And most of it has been futile. So he was excited to let me know this week that he had hit an all-time record days in a row of being porn-free. After years of fighting, he had 18 days in a row of being porn-free. Now, I was really excited for him and told him how proud I was. He's a little embarrassed that the number was so low, but also proud of himself at the same time. But here's the thing. If he buys into worldly thinking about hope, he'll think, I'm just wishing God would change me. And next time he falls, he'll give up. But when he understands that Christian hope is based on the empty tomb, that it is a confident expectation that God is going to forgive him and purify him and strengthen him and give him a healthy marriage, then he'll be able to walk forward in faith knowing God's got me even if I don't see it. See, if you want to know God has a destiny for you, understand Christian hope is not a wish. Let's go back to our key verse, Genesis 50, verse 20. Again, he says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. So remember Joseph's story. He faced a false accusation of rape, was imprisoned for it. We don't know exactly how long he was in prison. Old Jewish commentators uh, suggest 11 years. We don't know that from the Bible. We know it, it was minimum two years. I'm guessing that boyhood dreams don't get you very excited when you're wasting time away in prison. But here's a key lesson when you look at Joseph's life as a whole. Most of the time, destined doesn't feel like it. Most of the time, it doesn't feel like you have a destiny. Think about Joseph's life. Having a destiny meant being sold by his brothers. Being destined felt like falsely convicted. Being destined felt like your life is rotting away. Being destined meant being forgotten, being destined, I'm guessing, meant dealing with anger at a life that means absolutely nothing. Most of the time, living out your destiny will feel like folding laundry. Living out your destiny will feel like getting the oil changed. It'll feel like praying that same prayer for the thousandth time, leaving a generous tip that you're never thanked for, reading one more chapter of the Bible, being destined to feel like writing a thank you note. But when you do those things, to faithfully do your duty, you're part of something much bigger. See, look at what Joseph said at the end of the verse. God did this, so I could save the lives of many people. He served so that others could be saved. That's it. This makes me think of life in the church. I think God put you in your position so you could serve so that others might be saved. A few of our SE Kids volunteers share with me about this guy named James, who serves at our Blankenbaker campus, had all kinds of health difficulties. And one week when there was a push to join the SE Kids volunteer team, he signed up, but he was scared. In fact, he said, I was, I was more scared walking into a room of preschoolers at Southeast than I was when I got on a plane to go to war in Iraq. <laughs> he said, what if they're scared of me? What if they ask a Bible question I don't know? But he said, all they want to do is sit on the floor and play, have him read to him and hold his hand as they walk to worship. Phyllis Berryman is 83 years old. She's a widow. After her husband passed away in 2014, she said, I have a lot of love left to give. So she started serving at the Indiana campus doing uh, baptism laundry and prepping preschool supplies during the week. And she, uh, she uh, has been through cancer and just had knee replacement, but she's already back serving with a smile so that others can be saved. Sally Ferry has been serving in early childhood since 2008. She worked um, with the young kids, obviously, and she had breast cancer. Uh, uh, 
And throughout the treatments and surgeries, she still kept coming back every week to serve. And the kids were just fascinated with her because she she used to have really long hair. And now she comes in to serve uh, bald, but she has a smile every week loving on our kids. I believe those people are part of God's big plan for this church. Now, if you're cynical, you could say, all they're doing is prepping preschool supplies. All they're doing is folding Baptism towels. Yeah, you're right. But I think I'm right too because most of the time destined doesn't feel like it. Because when you do serve, great things can happen. And maybe I'm naive. Maybe I'm just the new guy and don't know better. But I just don't believe that God is done using Southeast Christian Church. I don't believe he's brought us this far and had decades of greatness done through the people of this church for us to just sit on our laurels. I believe God has destined us for such a time as this to seek and save the lost by serving them. And I would never presume to know the mind of the Lord, but I just wonder, I wonder if we as a church family could see a day like in the book of Acts where we baptize 3,000 people in a single day. I wonder if we can continue to plant new churches, but instead of scouring the country to recruit church planters, we just raise up so many church planters, we stop scouring the country because we just send out our own people to plant all these churches. I wonder if we could reach the day where we actually have to turn people away from serving in SE kids because we say we're full. We can't have any more volunteers. You have to stop coming, go serve somewhere else. I wonder if we could see the day where our student ministry is reaching so many students that it infects the entire region of the country that when we have a church-wide student event, we can't even host it at our biggest campus because they won't fit and we have to rent the KFC Yum Center just for a student event. I wonder if divorce lawyers in the area would have to change the way they practice because people in our region know when your marriage is in trouble, you just go to Southeast Christian and God infects you and your marriage gets better and divorce lawyers are out of practice. I wonder if we could see a church where every person is being discipled and every person is discipling. I wonder if social services would have to stop advertising for foster families because they know, well, Southeast just takes them all. I wonder if we see the day where 100% of us are in the word every day and maybe most of all, I wanna see the day where you baptize that one person outside our church family and hear them say the good confession and you give them a big old bear hug after you baptize them. And And here's the tough part. The tough part is if God wants to use us in a great way, if we're like Joseph, it won't feel like a great way because most of the time destined to Destined doesn't feel like it. And the reason this point matters so much is because so many of you are new followers to Christ. And if you expect following Jesus every day to be like your favorite worship moment, or you're going to the passion conference every moment of every day forever, you're going to be sorely disappointed. But people who last in the Christian life have realized God wants me to do my duty and I will do what the flashlight of God's will has illuminated in front of me. I will take one step forward and do what he asks, and then I will do another and another and another. And you do that for days and then weeks and ultimately years on end, and you are someone other people look up to as a model Christian. I was at Chick-fil-A last week, and it was the middle of rush hour, and uh, I'd had lunch with my friends and I was going up to get a refill of my sweet tea and I was staying at one end of the corner, a worker I did not know or recognize from the other end of the counter shouted out my name. He said, Carl, and he comes running over. He's getting drinks for his customers he's waiting on and he's in a rush. He says, hey, what advice would you give somebody who wants to go into professional ministry? And I'm kind of on the spot, was not expecting this. What I was really thinking was, I'd have him refill my sweet tea? Uh, I didn't say that. But what I said was, I think you just gotta say yes to every serving opportunity you get. He goes, okay, and he filled up his drinks and he went over to his customers. Now, I don't know if he'll do that, but if he does, I believe he'll be living out God's plan for his life because most of the time, destined doesn't feel like it. Okay, take a step back, think of our two points. Christian hope is not a wish. Most of the time, destined doesn't feel like it. Both of these are really things we need to get up here, but there's a third point from Joseph's life that we actually go do, that we actually live out. 
And think about Genesis chapter 50. If you picture the scene, Joseph's life looks great. He's on a throne. We know he has a wife and kids. As far as we know, that's going well. He's, uh, he's been reunited with his brothers. He's rich. He's got influence. He's living out God's will. Like we would trade places with Joseph. That's a good deal. Things are going well for him. But remember, he had to go through pain to get there. One author in his book on Joseph said this, the brothers always come back. In other words, the pain that we want to leave in the past is always part of the process. See, a lot of us, and and, and me too, a lot of us want to use our talents for God's kingdom. A lot of us want to use our passions for God's kingdom. And those are good things. You, You should desire to use your talent and passion for God's kingdom. Do that. But the problem is when I read the scriptures, most often God uses something else. I mean, think think of scriptures very quickly. Think of the story of Ruth. It opens with her becoming a widow and saying to her mother-in-law, I guess I'm just gonna follow you wherever you go. Think of what Paul often says. He talks about beatings and imprisonments and, and trials he has to go through just to plant churches and share the gospel. When God tells Moses, hey, you're gonna be my mouthpiece. Moses says, I have a stutter. What are you talking about? When David writes one of his most famous Psalms, he writes about the affair he had that everybody knew about. See, what I see most often in scriptures is people using their pain for God's purpose. And when you think about it, it's the stories of pain that help you in your Christian journey. If you go to a marriage event to help your marriage get better and somebody stands up front and they say, you know what, uh, my spouse and I, we have the perfect marriage. We've, we've just never fought and we're gonna teach you how to have the perfect marriage today. That's not really gonna help you. But if somebody stands up and says, you know what, marriage is hard. And my spouse and I have been through it. In fact, we're gonna tell you some of those stories today. And we have found the only thing that can keep our marriage together and eventually even make it healthy is hanging on to Jesus. And we wanna teach you how to do that today. What are you gonna do? You're gonna lean in. It's why when you go to an encounter group, you're in a circle with other people who are grieving. You're in a circle with other people who are addicted. You're in a circle with other people who have your struggle. So when they say, here's my struggle, you say, me too. It's why my wife and I sat on the phone with someone we love dearly after the greatest pain of her entire life, the worst we can imagine. And she said through tears, I don't want this to be my ministry. This is the pain of my life and I have no idea what to tell people to do with it. And we gently said back, that's why it's your ministry, because you don't have any answers, but you know the pain and you know Jesus. See, I believe the biggest lesson from Joseph's life is this, you are destined to use your pain for God's purpose. I hope he uses your talents. I pray he uses your passions, but I know he wants to use your pain because your pain is your platform. Occasionally, somebody asks a Christian, hey, what's the reason for your joy? And you get to tell them. Occasionally, somebody asks a Christian, hey, what's the reason for your success? And you tell them. But often, somebody asks the Christian, hey, how did you get through that? And you say, you really wanna know? I'll tell you. That's why Paul says, look at it, so now I'm, I'm glad to boast about my weakness. Why? So that the power of Christ can work through me. When you use your pain for God's purpose, a hurting world takes note. On August the 1st, 1991, I got lumped up for three counts of murder. I would always share with the people that worked for me, do not steal from me. You don't have to. Ask me, I'll give it to you. Well, one person stole, he lost his life. Walter Webster, Michael Neely, He lost his life. He got shot in the back of the head while in the car, while I'm driving. Abram Webster, 
He got shot at point blank range with a a sawed off shotgun. Lost his life. I was born uh, October 26, 1961, in the West End of Louisville, Kentucky. When I was born, my my dad was in federal prison. My mother was a, a queen pin. You know, we sold drugs for a living. She would teach us there is no God. God's not putting nothing on his table. You just look back at, to see how you've been trained in a certain way. And you see the generational curses that permeate within your family. My mother ran her organization with a tight fist. Every day you're going home to a lifestyle of drugs. You're seeing your mom OD. We saved her three times. She taught us. When I OD, this is how you save me. And I would see my mom and I would see my dad and how they would utilize this product to get money or to get things done. I was like a sponge. I would soak all that up. And I would see that it's, this is power. From teenager to being a man and running my own empire. At that point, I had superseded everything my mother had done. It's always a generational curse. After the acts of murder of Michael Neely, Walter Webster, and Avon Webster, I, I slept well. You're conditioned that way, in that lifestyle. August 1st, 1991, I get, I get locked up. I'm a drug dealer, so I start bringing drugs into the jail. I'm removed from the street, and I'm still selling drugs. It seemed like something would click and say, hey, you need to stop. I don't know how to stop. Until September 26, 1992, my mother came to me in my maximum security jail cell in the basement, plexiglass right here. And she told me, with tears running down her eyes, baby boy, you need to change. I'm sorry. I taught you wrong. You need to change in your life. You need to try Jesus. And I screamed. Telling me I need to try no Jesus now because they tried me for the death penalty. Mother, I don't want to hear that right now, okay? Don't go get weak on me now. And she said, No. Baby boy, you need a change. Forgive me. After that visit, uh, room was the size. That bed was right here. And all this is going through my head. And that jailhouse minister came. I said, you always come here telling us we need Jesus Christ. The other day, my mother was here telling me, I need Jesus Christ. He said, you do. As I see you on the news, every day and they talk about you're a horrible person you're a menace to society and that you need to fry the electric chair and he asked me have you ever heard of Paul in the Bible he killed Christians and Christ used him for the kingdom God uses murderers he can use me he said he uses people just like you and he asked me he said uh would you like to accept him? If he can change my mother, he's got to be able to change me. And from that moment forward, the life that I had lived up until then was a life that I would no longer live. I got locked up in August 91. My daughter was born two months later. Didn't get to hold her as a free man knowing that I didn't want to do with them how my fathers and my mother and my generational curse did with me, but yet, here I am, looking and spending the rest of my life in prison. Even though you saved, sanctified, and set apart, you still have that pain. You look at your kids, 
and then come on visit after visit after visit, year after year after year. Daddy, are you ever coming home? And whatever opportunity you are given, you give them Jesus Christ. Because they see, even though you are incarcerated, my daddy's making a difference. And that breathes hope that my sons could even say, I'm proud of my daddy, even from where he's at. Five guys inside the chapel. It seats 50. Pastor Larry Coleman. He said, I, I know you. I see you on the news all the time. They said, you're never getting out of prison. But God, was Satan meant for evil, God turned it for good. There's a hierarchy in prison. Murderers are way up here. Child molesters are way down here. Rapists, way down here. Somebody of my stature gets props, especially you have somebody who was always in the newspaper. But what I would share with them, don't be like what I was. Be like what I am. The old man is dead. This is a new man. As I live for Jesus Christ now. No, 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 don't do that, don't do that. No, we've been waiting on you to get here. They've been waiting on the darkness. But darkness didn't show up. The light showed up. So then they would begin to say, okay, I can trust you. And I remember this pastor telling us, God is gonna use you five men here in this chapel to start a revival in the Kentucky penal system. But that's what happened. Men believing in the power of God started compelling the men to come in. This chapel is not going to be big enough to hold. When well, you talk about 100 men trying to fit the chapel, so the fire marshal come and said, no, we got to shut it down. So then he got to have to go to the kitchen. So many, 200 men in the kitchen, shut it down. Go to the gym. 350 men in the gym, shut it down. We got to build these people a church. They built a quarter of a million dollar church right there on that property. My first miracle is receiving 25 to life, not being on death row. My second miracle was when I walked out of prison January 2nd, 2018. I went to the parole board, and a week later, all seven, for the first time in the history, said, we got to let you go. Because I saw the work that Jesus Christ was doing. Convicted of three counts of murder, capital kidnapping, tried for a death penalty, and they just released me. I didn't have to go to no groups. I didn't have to go to anything, but go do what Jesus Christ has created you to do. And that's operate and bless in the West End of Louisville. God called me to start New Day Ministries, which is to break the cycle and change the culture within the West End of Louisville. We do love walks. We do camp change. We do the summer enrichment program, the school the after-school program, Speed School of Engineering magnet program that we have. Satan meant it for bad to destroy. But Christ turned it all for good to explode within a community to give the love of Jesus Christ and help others to breathe life, love, inspiring future excellence to come out. Now my sister's saved. My brothers are saved. My nieces and nephews are saved. And it started with all the trouble I had to go through to come to that place out of darkness into light to bring them into the light. And those three people, Michael Neely, Walter Webster, and Abram Webster, I call their names often because the Lord showed me, you live a life of making amends for the lives that you had a part of them not being here. Christ Jesus told me, you have to do more for me than you ever did for Satan. I killed for Satan. Now I get life for Jesus Christ.
Todd's story reminds me of a verse towards the beginning of Joseph's story. Look at it. But the Lord was with Joseph in the prison and showed him his faithful love. I think a lot of us hear about God's will and we think, really? Because you're in prison. And maybe not a literal cell, but you are in a prison of grief or of loneliness. You're in a prison of sickness. You're in a prison of other people's decisions. But God, but God is with you in the prison and he's showing you his faithful love even today. And you, not be, me, <clears throat> you may not be able to see a way out yet. And you don't know how it's going to end. You don't know how it could end good. But God is with you and he will never leave you and he will never forsake you. And he is with you until he calls you home as his child. And the reason you know it's true, you don't have to wish it's true, is because the tomb is empty. He was seen, so our hope is real. See, the interesting thing is that the story of Joseph is ultimately a story about Jesus. Think about it. Joseph was loved as the favorite son of his father but he was a slave in a foreign land, unjustly imprisoned. But eventually he was raised up so he could save the lives of many. And Jesus is loved as the only begotten son of his father. He became slave to human constraints in a land that was not his own, but he was raised up after an unjust execution on the cross so he could save whosoever may come. But then he was raised from the dead so you could walk in your destiny with confident expectation. We talk a lot about the will of God. What's God's will for my life? So we would be remiss if we did not end this series with 1 Timothy chapter two. I'll show you God's will. God wants everyone to be saved. God wants everyone, God wants you to be saved. God's desire is that you know him, that you would humble yourself, that you would repent of making yourself your own God, but you would place your faith, your trust in Jesus forever and not yourself any longer, that to show your faith, you would be baptized, representing being dying, dying to your old self and being raised to new life in Christ, and then that you would do your duty, even though it doesn't feel destined, by serving others every day as you follow Christ. And if you do that, one day you'll hear those great words, well done, good and faithful servant. Let's pray together. God, we pray for those in prison. First of all, God, we pray for the literal prisoner. We remember our Christian brothers and sisters in prison as if we ourselves are suffering. Give them comfort and hope and endurance. Help them do their duty today. And God, I pray for those here in these rooms who are in prison, prisons of grief and loneliness and shocked by the news and, and devastated by what happened. God, comfort them. God, treat them the way you treated Joseph, that you are with them in the prison showing your faithful love. Thank you for loving us, Lord. Thank you for loving us. It is in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. If you wanna live out, if you wanna live out God's destiny for your life by giving your life to Jesus Christ, or if something in the service has stirred up, something in you and you say, you know, I just need a quiet moment of prayer with somebody, then as we worship, we want you to head to the next step area on the first floor over here. 
But all of us right now need to look inward. And we need to say, God, I too am a murderer because I put Jesus on the cross. But God showed me grace. So will you take a moment as we celebrate communion together with the bread and juice that represent Jesus' body and blood. And you can eat and drink it when you're ready, but thank God in this moment for his truth and for his grace that sets us free. Let's celebrate communion right now. Yeah.
right, Southeast family, thank you so much for joining us uh, today. What a great Sunday. Mm -hmm. As always, we look forward to hearing from you. Let us know. Sarah and I would love to follow up with you along yeah. with the SC Online team. But mm -hmm. Carl, concluding this message on destiny, what a great yeah. message, Sarah. What was it you wrote down on your phone as Man. you were going through it? <laughs> I took a lot of notes. I'm not going to lie. Um, but my favorite thing that he said was, hope is not a wish. Mm -hmm. It's confident expectation. And that made me think that so many times yeah. in my life, when I pray for specific things from the Lord and I say I'm hoping in Him, I'm actually just wishing that He answers the way I want yeah. Him to. He's not but, a genie. Yeah, but hope is different. It's a confident expectation yeah. of, okay, God, I'm gonna pray for this. Mm -hmm. And even if you don't give me what I want, and it, you work through the purpose and the pain, like that's worth it, yeah. right? Because our hope has to be accurately placed in Him and who He is and not in what we're just wanting. Yeah, there, there is, it, it, there is so many times too, the journey is through the pain that mm -hmm. that's what connects you to others and really yeah. where God reveals so much and refines us in ways yeah. that's so unique. You see that um, in the life of, mm -hmm. life of Joseph as well. So mm -hmm. uh, such a challenging message. So uh, loved being able to look at that the last few weeks and as we bring that series to a close. Uh, one thing we wanna let, let our online family know about that's coming up uh, in October is homecoming, homecoming. is coming back. So uh, SE Online family, this is where we invite you to be here in Louisville, Kentucky. It's in October. In October. Uh, just text the word homecoming to <laughs> 733-733 to sign up. So what's your favorite yes. part about that? Okay, so my favorite part about homecoming, we were actually talking about this earlier, but homecoming last year, I'd only been on staff for like a month, but yep. I'd already made so many relationships online yep. that I got to see fulfilled in person. But now after being on staff a year and getting to be able to see so many of you that we've connected with online is going to be so sweet. And I know that it's going to be great for you as well too. You know, if you've been in an online group and you've never met your group in person, this is a great opportunity to meet them. So please come out for homecoming. It's going to be great. Registration's open. Text homecoming to 733-733. Yeah. And I think it's that opportunity too, to see that what's happening, what you're experiencing right now mm -hmm. online when you come in person as you see that it's a real thing yeah. with real relationships and real mm -hmm. people and I think what you will leave like most people after they come for homecoming weekend when they leave they feel affirmed mm -hmm. and they're like oh this place That's is what word. I thought it was like what it appears yeah. to be online I just looked behind the curtain and saw it's the real deal. So please sign up, uh, text the word homecoming to 733-733 and uh, sign up today because uh, we would love to hear from you. Now, May is Mental Health Awareness mm -hmm. Month and uh, our church in response to that does all sorts of things to journey alongside folks. We have a whole ministry at Southeast called Care Ministry and joining us right now is a member of that team. This is yeah. Nick, he's on our Care Ministry team and we're excited because it's a, it's a ministry that we do a lot locally with Louisville but this summer, it's not like that. We're doing a lot online with tons yes. of stuff happening. So Nick, <laughs> take us into what CARE is doing this summer. Absolutely, for all sorts of people, we're gonna be offering two big workshops completely run by our CARE team, which if people don't know too, some of them are licensed therapists, counselors yep. who bring a wealth of knowledge. Uh, two workshops we can look forward to is one, the first one being on relationships. We mm -hmm. know that God has wired us for a relationship. Yep. But how do we do it well? Yeah. How do we find trust and, and be free to have transparency in those mm -hmm. relationships? So we want to give people an opportunity to do that. We'll be actually offering them uh, at Shelby County on Mondays. They'll be here at the Blanket Baker campus on Thursdays, but also for our online family, you can sign up to do the uh, the workshops on Thursday online as well. Mm, yeah, that's, that's awesome, Nick. Who is this for specifically? Is this kind of like for everybody? Who are the workshops really in relationship for? Honestly, I would say the workshops are for, for anyone. Mm. High school and up, come join us. We are also talking about the way we think mm -hmm. is our second workshop in the mm -hmm. summer starting in July and really the impact of our thinking both on our relationships, our perspective in life is so important. So really, yes, anyone mm -hmm. can come out high school and up, come sign up for the workshop. We really think you'll benefit from it. And I love that's that awesome. that we're doing this because we're speaking into the heartbeat of people and how many people have relationship problems. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the number one thing that impacts our life is mm -hmm. the relationships we have with ourselves, with others, with our spouse, with our family. And yeah. I love that you're doing that. So you can text the word workshop. Workshop. 733. Give me all the information, but yeah, you made that yeah. easier. So text That's workshop awesome. and sign up. Uh, if someone's like not in crisis, but they're in that in-between mm -hmm. state, what do you say to them? I would say this might be a great way to check out what the care ministry does as a whole. Yep. It's a very an, an open door policy. Yep. Even if you want to attend one session yep. and, and just do that for the whole workshop, that's mm -hmm. great. Uh, but also you'll be able to interact with some of our care team and say, hey, wait, what other options are there for me with my current situation? And we could tell you all Love the that. different things that we do at mm -hmm. Southeast. Yeah, that's great, Nick. I think a lot of people don't know all the things that Encounter and Care offer here at church. And so I think that's 
a good word. It's a great opportunity to just get connected with Encounter and Care as a yep. whole um, and just know what all they have to offer. So text that word workshop to 733 Yes, you should. We'd love for you to be involved. Starts next week, correct? Yes, Not this week Thursday. week of June 5th. Week of June 5th. One other thing that's happening next week is Kyle's book, When Your Way Isn't Working, is releasing. We're really excited about that. Yeah, I love that. So Kyle's book comes out. You can buy it wherever you buy books. And uh, to go alongside that, see what we've done here is we've got a sermon series called <laughs> When Your Way Isn't Working. So it's a, the perfect yeah. companion to it. So um, as a church family, we're going to be going through the same material he's going to be preaching about it, but you can also read the book. So make sure you check that out uh, and get ready for next week. Y'all at home, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to Nick and the Care Ministry team. We're so glad that you're part of Southeast Online. You are what make us a family, so thank you for giving us your time and attention. Other than that, everybody, we'll see you back at the same times next week. Bye, Have a great week.